Before we look at another practical example of Go code, we're going to cover almost all the remaining language features, except for Go routines and channels we'll get to later because they involve concurrency and that's a whole big topic unto itself. So first off, uh, I did mention that Go has a C style syntax, meaning that its syntax follows the basic pattern of the C language, like a lot of other languages, Java, JavaScript, um, several other popular mainstream languages today have a C-like syntax. They imitate the basic syntax rules of C. And in C, the rule is that most kinds of statements have to end in semicolons. Well, that's actually the case in Go as well. Like say this var statement here does have to have a semicolon. This assignment statement has to have a semicolon. This return statement has to have a semicolon. Um, and then you also can have a semicolon at the end of your for range loop. I don't know if it's required, but it is allowed. And same here at the end of your function. I don't know if there's a semicolon required there, but it is allowed. But the reason we don't normally write these in Go is because as a convenience, the compiler will actually insert them in certain places according to a simple set of rules. And that rule is that at the end of any line that ends with an identifier, which is a, a name you define in code like uh, total here or, or sum, the name of the function, or built-in type names like int and bool, those are considered um, identifiers, uh, or a line ending with a literal, which is like a number literal, like the number zero here, or like a string literal in double quote marks, those are literals, uh, or lines ending with the reserved words break, continue, fall through, return, or the operators plus plus or minus minus, and lines ending with the symbols n paren and n curly brace. A line ending with any one of these things, if there's not a semicolon there, the compiler will insert one implicitly. So in fact, Go is actually a, what we would call a freeform language because it doesn't really dictate how you format your code. Um, if we make our semicolons explicit, like we can do things like this. Y you could put this statement immediately after the, the var statement on, and they can both be on the same line. And because the semicolon is denoting the end of this var statement, then another statement can be on the same line. You can do this. I don't recommend it. It's not normal Go style, but it is legal. So in another video, I discuss how numbers are represented as bits. And as I discussed, uh, when you have integers or floating point numbers, the range of possible values you can represent depends on how many bits you use to represent the number. So if you have a 64-bit integer, then, then you can represent more values than if you had like a 16-bit integer, uh, and likewise with floats. And so Go uh, will give you options. There's not just an int type and a float type. There's, In fact, there's no type called float. There's either float32 or float64 where float32 is 32 bits and float64 is 64 bits. And 64 bits, of course, gives you a larger range of possible values. So you may sometimes decide that you don't need the full 64 bits and you're trying to save some memory. So instead you'll just go for float32 because you know for a fact that for your purposes, 32 bits is adequate. Uh, otherwise, I would say just uh, default to float64, consider it sort of your default choice on a modern system. You're, you'll generally be fine. Uh, and then for integers, we have a lot of options. We have 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit, and 64-bit. And also we have a choice of signed versus unsigned. So all these that begin with U, those are the unsigned uh, variants where like a, a U int 16, it's 16 bits just like an int 16, but the range is not split between positive and negative values. You effectively have a, you have twice the range of positive values, but you don't have any negative values. So that's the distinction there. And we also have these types called rune and byte but they're really just aliases. Rune is really just an alias for int32. And the reason we have this is because sometimes in code, you want to use integers to represent the individual characters of a Unicode string. And in that context, we call them runes. So we have this rune type, but it's really just an int32. They're exactly equivalent. So whether you call your int32s runes or not, is just a stylistic thing. And same for bytes. Byte is just an alias for uint8. It's an 8-bit unsigned integer. There's no distinction to the compiler. And then most perplexing of all is that the int type and the uint type, the types we actually use most commonly, those actually, depending upon the target we're compiling for, are going to be 32 bits or 64 bits. If you compile and run your program on a 32-bit platform, your ints and uints will be 32 bits in size. But if you compile and run your program on a 64-bit platform, your, your ints and uints will be 64 bits in size. So this is a bit perplexing because why would you not just want to specify exactly what the size is? Well, on a 32-bit system, uh, the, the way the CPU works and the memory works is that it more naturally deals with data in chunks of 32 bits. And so if you have 32 bit integers, the code generally will run more efficiently than if you had 64 bit integers. And likewise on a 64 bit system, those systems deal more naturally with uh, integers in chunks of 64 bits of eight bytes. And so it's uh, generally more efficient to work with 64 bit integers. 
The problem that arises though is if we have these ints and uints, which on some platforms are 32 bits, on other platforms are 64 bits, what might happen is that your, your code will work correctly on one platform, but then incorrectly on another. Like say, if you assume your ints are gonna be 64 bits in size and you, you create val int values that are using the full 64 bit range, well, on a 32 bit platform, that's gonna create problems because you don't have the, the, the full range there. Um, and so you would effectively have a bug. You'd have different behavior on different platforms. So the solution there is, well, maybe you just compile for 32 bit and don't worry about 64 or vice versa. That's one solution. Um, but if you want the same code to work on both systems, then, well, the solution then is to, when you use ints and uints, to treat them as if they are 32 bits and don't use the full 64 bit range, which sounds a bit odd because it's it seems wasteful. Like, why am I using all these extra bits if I don't need them? Well, yeah, it's, it's using more storage. But again, as I explained on a 64 bit system, those systems will deal more naturally with 64 bit chunk integers. And so, yeah, you're, you're wasting bits that you're never using effectively, but it, it still in general will make the code more efficient generally. So in practice, I would say when it comes to floats, I would just default to float 64 until you know for good reason that you want to use float 32s. Like maybe you're st storing a whole bunch of floats, like a big array, and you, don't, you know that they don't need to be 64 bit, they can all be 32 bit. So maybe in that case, you go with float 32s. When it comes to integers, well, we use bytes quite often because we're dealing with binary data that we read from files and so forth. So you, you'll be using bytes quite often. Um, otherwise, almost always just use int. Sometimes uint in the case where we know for a fact that we don't need negative numbers, you might go for a uint. And then the other ones only really come into play when specific cases where you happen to know that, well, for this purpose, I'm storing a lot of data, like I'm storing like a big array, say, of, of integers, but I know they don't need to be more than 16 bits in size, so I'm gonna make them all in 16s. So outside those niche cases, you just, when in doubt, make them ints, make them bytes when you know you're dealing with bytes, and all the others only arise in basically niche circumstances. In GoPigeon, when we write number literals, the number literals that are integers, like 500 here, are considered to be integer values rather than floating point, and values with a decimal point in them are considered to be floating points. So 4.7 here will be a floating point value, not an integer. In actual Go, in real Go, number literals aren't considered to have any type. They're called constants, and they're not considered to be typed. Uh, so 500 for here, for example, is not specifically an int. It's not an int 8. It's not an int 16, int 32, uint, any of those. It's just a number itself. But the compiler does know that uh, here x, which we're defining to be a uint 16, well, 500 is a valid value, and so it knows this is a valid assignment. Uh, likewise here, for an int 8, we can assign the value negative 60 because that is a valid value in range of an int 8. And likewise, when we assign 4.7 to this float32 variable, that again is a valid value. So the compiler says this is all okay. Uh, however, here, uh, when we assign to x the value 1 million, well, x is defined to be a uint 16, and the max value for a uint 16 would be uh, 65,535. And so obviously a million is out of that range, it's not valid. And the compiler looks at this and says, oh, that's, that's invalid, that's not a valid uh, uint 16 value. Uh, and likewise, uh, negative 200 here for y, and int 8, the, the smallest negative value is negative 128. So this is again outside the range. And then if we did uh, negative 50 times 4, this is an operation on two constants. And so the, actually the compiler will compute this at compile time and it says, okay, that's negative 200. And again, it knows that negative 200 is not a valid value to sign to y uh, because y is an int 8 and negative 200 is outside the range. Why, of course, we can't assign 4.7 because 4.7 is not an integer value, so that also is illegal. But then here, when we assign z the value 9, well, 9, it doesn't look like a floating point number. It's an integer, but it's in the range of the fl of float32, so it's still valid. And also, we can use uh, engineering notation to express exponents. So this is actually 9.2 times 10 to the fourth, but this is all one number constant. And again, the compiler knows, of, okay, that's valid. That's within the range of z. Uh, but then here, the compiler knows that for a float32, an exponent of 50 goes outside of its range, so this is invalid. And lastly, 9.32498759, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This actually is not a value that can be represented fully accurately in a float32. The significant is just too much precision. We don't have sufficient precision in a float32. But the compiler won't object to this. It'll just approximate. It'll round this into something that can be represented as a float32. So I don't know what that would be. That's probably something like, I don't know, something about that much precision, I would guess, but 
I don't know for sure. So again, number literals are constants and they don't have a type, but the compiler does check if they're valid for the type that is expected. So with all these different number types, very often what we need to do is convert values of one number type to other number types. And we can do that as we do here. So we have this uint16 variable x, which has the initial value 500, and the int8 variable y, which has the initial value negative 60. And first off, what we can't do is just assign x to y because they're different types. As far as the component is concerned, yeah, they're both numbers, they're both integers, but they're different kinds of integers, so it doesn't like this assignment. If we want to assign to y, what we need is an int8 value, and so we need to take x, our uint16, and make it an int8 value, and we do so with this syntax. You, you call the type name like it's a function, and then you provide the value which we want to convert into an int8. So we want to convert x. We want to get its equivalent as an int8. We're not actually modifying x, of course, be clear. x is staying as it is, but we're getting its int8 equivalent. And the way that we have to do that is, well, an int16 has more bits than an 8 int. It has twice as many. You, you of course, can't fully accurately represent a 16-bit value with only 8 bits. We're going to lose information. And so what happens here is we just simply truncate the highest 8 bits. So the value 500 as bits, um, as a uint16, looks like this. And we're going to end up cutting off, just truncating those highest 8 bits, and we're left with just the lowest byte. And what that is... Uh, as a int 8, as, an, as a signed integer value, those 8 bits are just the value negative 12. So strangely, when we converted the value 500 from a uint 16 into an int 8, we didn't get the value 500 because you can't represent 500 as an int 8. You just can't have that. It just does, doesn't make any sense. Um, but we decided we wanted to do it anyway, and when we did it, and what we ended up with is negative 12. Going in the other direction, if we take our int 8 value y and, and get its uint 16 equivalent, what happens is that the 8 bits gets padded out to 16 bits, and we, and we do so by, well, well here's the current value of y. It's this 8-bit value. Its highest bit is this 1, and so we get a, a whole other byte here of a bunch of 1s. And so this value, represented as a uint16, is 65,524. So in these two cases, when we converted from a uh, uint16 value to an int8 and vice versa, the results we got... Uh, admittedly are probably not very useful because the the result bears no obvious relationship to the original value. There's so much distortion that's uh, seem, seemingly unrelated, in fact, to the original value. So it's kind of questionable in this case of whether the conversion makes any sense. But in the same scenario, if, say, x started with a value which is both an int8 and uint16 value, as it does here, 20, that's both a uint8 and uint16 value, well, now when we get the int8 equivalent of x, we're getting the value 20, just expressed as a different type, because what happens here is that uh, we're truncating the, the top 8 bits, and well, here's what 20 looks like. Hack off the top uh, 8 bits, and you're left with these, which is expressed as an int8. That's, that's 20. It's the same value, just in a different form. Uh, and now if we take the value of y, which is 20, and convert it to a uint16, uh, we're padding out to 16 bits, uh, extending the highest bit, which is a 0, so we just get back the original uint16 value we have. We get, we get back this, and again, it's still 20. So now we have a conversion between types, which seems meaningful, seems useful, because we happen to know that the value is within range of the target type, and so you can do a, a non-distorting conversion, whereas the distorting kind of conversions, um, I'm sure there, there's niche circumstances where they're, they're useful, I'm sure. I can't think of one off the top of my head, um, but they're generally not meaningful and useful, generally. Here we have a variable x, which is a uint8. It's a byte value with the initial value 244. And what happens when you do arithmetic with a typed value and a constant, which has no type, the result of that operation is the same type. So because we're adding a uint8 to a constant, the result of that is a uint8 value. So you add 244 and 6, and we get back as a uint8 value 250. And of course, uh, here we can just use the convenience syntax uh, to make this more compact. And this is the same thing as adding 6 to x, assigning the result to x. The question arises, though, of what happens when we do an arithmetic operation and the mathematically correct result doesn't fit in range of the result type. So here, uh, x, again, is a uint8. It's a byte value. We add 6 to it, and mathematically, we should get the result 256, right? But... 256 is outside the range of, of a uint8. The, the max value for uint8 is 255. We're, we're one above. And so what we actually get back here is the value of zero. We get overflow uh, 
where it rolls from the top value, rolls back down to the bottom range and just proceeds from there. When you get 256, you actually get zero. And here when we add X and 10, instead of getting uh, 260, we get four. Because for every value beyond 255, we're, we're actually rolling back to zero and counting up from there. So we get back four. That's called overflow. Uh, and then we also have what's called underflow. Like let's say X is zero now, we assign it the value zero and we subtract one. Well, it rolls back from the minimum value back to the highest value, 255. And if we subtract six, then we go from zero down to 255, then 254, 53, 52, 51, and then 250. Now, this behavior may seem wrong, and of course, mathematically, it is wrong, but the hardware, the way it operates is it's dealing with numbers represented with a fixed number of bits, and this is just baked into that cake. This is just a natural consequence of you're gonna have overflow and underflow, um, but the CPU actually does detect when overflow and underflow occurs, and it sets a little flag that you can test in your machine instructions. When Go, you can just do the logic of, well, I had two positive numbers, I added them together, and I got something that was smaller than either of them, so you could try and detect uh, overflow that way. There are various ways to account for this problem. Uh, but generally, we don't really need to. Generally, we're dealing with integers that are sufficiently sized and such that it's going to be very rare that our arithmetic is ever going to overflow the, the size of integer we're using. But it can happen, and you need to account for it. If you don't properly account for the possibility of overflow and underflow, then, yeah, you're going to have a bug. And there, there are cases in code where we do need to have arbitrary precision arithmetic. We need to be able to add numbers of any size or do mul multiply numbers of any size and get mathematically accurate results. And for that purpose in Go, there is in the standard library, there's a, a, an arbitrary precision number type, which we can use for such purposes. And it, it does all that business for us of accounting for the overflow and underflow flags that get triggered in the CPU and, and using as many bits as necessary to store the, the result so that it's mathematically accurate results. But it turns out actually in, in most code deals with integer numbers that are very comfortably within the range of a 32-bit or 64-bit integer. And yeah, there are cases where overflow and underflow sneaks up on us and we didn't anticipate it, but they're relatively rare for actually most purposes. We get by even though our computers actually don't do arithmetic with full mathematical precision in certain cases.